Hi there, I'm Ken Sanders, and this is yet another edition of Ammo Can Library. We're going to dive into the ammo cans, as we always do. And first, I want to read to you from an obscure book from World War II. Um, it's called Beach Red by uh, Peter Bauman. Uh, most of us never heard of it. I'd never heard of it. Uh, the late Charles Bowden, a writer friend of mine who's been the subject of one ammo can library so far and will be the subject of another one because we are not done with Chuck Bowden yet. I learned early on in my relationship with Chuck that if he told me about a place or a person, an author, a book, whatever it was, there was a reason and I should pay attention. So Chuck, I can't have you ever read this book, Beach Red by Peter Bowman, never heard of it. It was published in November of 1945. It was a major selection of the Book of the Month Club, so it was a big deal. And I would argue that it's the first World War II anti-war book. It was written by an embedded journalist, the author, um, in the Pacific Theater and uh, tries to simulate in a 60-page word poem the actual invasion of one of the Pacific Island beach invasions in real time. So each two pages of the book contain this segment that's supposed to be one minute in real time of the actual beach invasion, and the page numbers are splattered in blood. It's as I started to say, it's, I believe, the first anti-war novel to come out of World War II. The more famous Norman Mailer's The Naked and the Dead was also released in 1945. I submit to you, this is the better book, the one you never heard of. I never would have heard it, of it either, except for Chuck Bowden. He's no longer around to advise me but I'm going to read you my favorite little section from this. Got to get out the magic spectacles. And, and each of these, I don't know what to call them, these, these two-page soliloquies ends with a little aphorism at the very end of it. They stumble over truth, but continue as if nothing happened. Battle doesn't determine who is right only who is left. It isn't the war that bothers him, it's the duration. Okay, here's my, my, the whole book is chilling. G.I. Joe, they call him, G.I. Joe, they say, as if it were something cute and cunning to be smiled at patronizingly. Sure, lots of laughs, plenty of jokes, the grinning kid, that's Joe. Ain't he a fetching little fella? If all there was to it was just washing his socks and his helmet, if all there was to it was just spending a night in a foxhole, if all there was to it was just eating the same tasteless rations out of a can three times a day, if all there was to it was just swinging down a road while the public relations office photographer took his picture, then he would believe the people who say how magnificent he is and how full of good humor he remains and how he is conducting himself through a dirty business with the dignity and courage and laughter of an American. But it's more than just that. It's a sharp cry held in a muted throat. It's seeing your buddy shot and listening to him breathe and watching his final movements. It's never having quite enough of everything at one time. 
If you've got a cigarette, nobody's got a match. If you've got a match, nobody's got a cigarette. If you have a razor, you find that your blades are unusable. If you have good blades, someone has borrowed your razor. If you have both razor and blades, you discover you have lost your shaving cream. And if you have all three, you're told there's no water for shaving anyway. It's a compound fracture of the illusions, an intimate hell where a corpse dances on a firelit wall, a lonely night that sobs itself to sleep, a demented hunchback babbling to himself in the dark, a tuneless piano with half of its keys missing, a blind man lost between stars on his way to God, a wild shrieking ride on a runaway nightmare, a spirit perpetually sagging at half-mast. Someday they'll put up a big monument to it in memory of all those boys who fell during the course of its being. And it will be made of marble with bronze statuary and a high sounding inscription cut into the sides. But if Joe had his way, he'd tear it down and melt the statues and let the marble crumble under indignant sledges. Oh yes. He'd put up a war monument, all right. It would be a little plot of ground in the middle of the main drag, fenced in by barbed wire, and in the center of it, there would be a drainage ditch dug with a pole over it and a crudely lettered sign saying latrine. And all the Joes would come and urinate in it and empty their bowels in it and throw garbage in it and fill it with red liquid that looked like blood and people would watch it flowing through a public fountain and they would smell it and they would be reminded of war. But you can't submerge tragedy that takes lessons in swimming. Beach Red by Peter Bowman. Bowman was a journalist in World War II. He, like I say, the book was huge. It was. I don't know about a bestseller, but the Book of the Month Club main selection, huge numbers of copies out there. It never was reprinted to this day, 75 years later. It never came out in paperback. I found very, very little biographical information about the long dead author now, except he had a couple of sons, and he want, wrote one other book. Uh, some 15 years later about the LSD and psychoactive experiments that they did on American GIs without their permission uh, throughout the 1950s and 60s. Beach Red, Peter Bowman.